All righty. Um, Leo VVA, take it away. OK, well, thank you, Amin. So you've just had a, a little roundup of the news. And we're going to get started now with some presentations. And uh, we're starting with uh, user developer stories. And uh, I was extremely interested in this section because I wanted to get a chance, basically, to tell you a little more about who I am and uh, how I got from basically being a user of Emacs to being, uh, nowadays, a package maintainer, and maybe more in the future, I don't know. So just for the organizers, I'm planning to speak for 15 minutes, and I'll have five more minutes of question at the end. So as I told you before, if you want to add questions, you know you can use the pad, and I'll be reading the questions from there. OK. So hi there. As Hamin introduced me before, my name is Leo Vivier. I'm a freelance software engineer engineer, I should say, actually, in France. And I have been using Emacs now for, I believe, close to eight years. I can't believe it's been so long. But yes, it's it's been a journey because, in a way, nothing uh, made me go for Emacs. You know, I'm an Emacs, uh, sorry, <laughs> I was about to say Emacs major, but no, I'm an English major. I went to university to study English literature and linguistics. And, you know, I just got started in Emacs because I was looking for ways to take better notes. I was looking for ways to uh, structure the way I was learning, structure the way I was uh, taking notes. And I stumbled one day upon this weird piece of software, which was called Emacs. And I've been trapped forever since, basically, because uh, eight years ago when I discovered Emacs, I just couldn't let go. There was just something very interesting about the way you configured your setup. And I just wanted to dive deeper and deeper. So the title of this, of this talk exactly is uh, how I went from user to package maintainer. And the package now that I'm maintaining is called Orgrom. And I'm not the only one doing this. I'm, uh, I'm helped with many lovely people uh, working with uh, on Orgrom. And you know, I, I could start it as a maintainer only this year. So that means that for the eight years I've been an Emacs user, seven of those years were spent merely being a user, trying to be a sponge for knowledge, trying to learn as much as I could. And you know, I believe it would be interesting for me to share my story, because I believe that I'm far from being the only user who can make the jump to being a maintainer. A lot of you have a lot of knowledge when it comes to Emacs. You know, some of you are at different steps in your journey. Some of you, for instance, are just starting to copy stuff out of Stack Exchange into your Emacs configuration. So let's say you want to do something very particular, and you haven't found a way to do so. So you go on Stack Exchange, you find something. Oh, that's interesting. You had it to your Emacs configuration. You barely understand anything that's going on. You know that it's supposed to be Emacs Lisp. <laughs> I don't. I hardly know Emacs, and I even less know what is Lisp supposed to be. But you paste it in, and it does what, it, what you want it to do. And you say, great, I'll move on to, to my work now. So that's how I got started. You know, I had a very Spartan setup for Emacs, which a lot of you must know. The first time you launch Emacs, you know, you have this feeling that you're jumping 20 years back in time, as far as the user inter interface is concerned. But as you get to spend more time with Emacs, you know, some would call it Stockholm Syndrome. In so far as you can't see how Spartan the entire thing is, but it actually is uh, a lovely prison, so to speak. So that's how I got started eight years ago. I just wanted to find a way to do my research properly. I wanted to have a, a tool that I could use to write my notes in plain text because I was already fairly adverse to uh, you know, uh, Microsoft solutions when it came to taking notes. So yeah, I got started in Emacs. I read a little bit about what plain text was about. And just to be clear, at the time, yes, I was fairly good with computers, but I was not a com computer science student. I had barely any experience with programmation and coding. And I was even less of a hacker back then. So you know, it just goes to show you that at the beginning, I had close to no knowledge, whether it be about the free software world, whether it be about... Sasha, do you want to say something? Uh, just confirming you're not sharing anything on the screen at the moment, right? Oh, no, no, I'm not sharing okay. anything. I'm just okay. uh, presenting yeah. like... Cool, right. thank you. 
So yes, so when I started, I had no experience whatsoever. Okay, I was just a literature major trying to uh, get better at taking notes. And you know, I stumbled upon LaTeX. And as many people who stumble upon LaTeX know, you, did, you don't just stumble upon LaTeX, you uh, embroil yourself in a turmoil of suffering, of late nights uh, tweaking, so that your document is exactly in the perfect shape you want it to be. But, you know, soon after, when I got started with Emacs and LaTeX, I discovered something that truly changed my life, and it was org mode. And as you'll get a lot of presentations this afternoon about org, org mode, sorry, I won't be spending too much time on it. But org mode, for me, was a revelation. It, there was something that upon reading articles on how to use org mode, especially uh, one of the key uh, articles that I've read, which really made a huge impact on me, was uh, the organize your life in plain text, which I'm sure many of you must have stumbled upon, uh, upon your, your Emacs journey. And you know, for me, when I stumbled upon this document, you know, I was starting to get interested in uh, getting getting things done and all the neaty, greedy stuff about organization and self-organization. It just felt like everything was under my fingertips to make the perfect workflow. And there was something incredibly satisfying about having a system that gave you so many options to configure your experience exactly how you wanted. And you know, you had this feeling that the people behind org mode had thought of everything. Whichever small adjustment that you needed in your workflow, whether it be more states for your to-dos, whether it be, oh, I want my weeks to start on Monday and not on Sunday. Oh, uh, it's uh, half past one and I need to, uh, in the morning, I mean, and I need to make sure that the item that I'm marking as done is done for the day before and not for the current day. You see what I'm talking about? So many details that were already present in org mode. And at first, you're really impressed because you think, wow, they thought of everything. But then you realize that it's just a matter of experience, just a matter of people uh, contributing codes because the development of org mode, Emacs, and everything is just open to the public. You know, It's like everything is being done with the garage door opened. You can just go on org mode on Savannah and see everything that is being developed. And for me, you know, the shift that occurred in my mind was when you know, I was reading all the options, I was looking at all the variables that I could modify for org mode. And there came a time, maybe two to three years ago, where I thought, oh, wow, maybe for the first time in a while, there is no option for me to do what I want to be doing with org mode. And I believe at the time, the, uh, the key issue that uh, triggered this reflex for me was I wanted to do something with the agenda. I wanted to have a super category. So, you know, in the, for those of you who know, uh, in your agenda, you have the ability to have many files and you have the ability to have categories. And I wanted somehow to group my, uh, you know, my to-dos in smaller groups or bigger groups, I should say. So that, for instance, I could have one group for my professional life. I could have a group for, uh, you know, one work, the second work, that I could have something for university and all this. And so I thought, yeah, I think I, I think I'd liked I'd like this, and after having spent so long, you know, working with Emacs and working with Org mode, you know, I had some ideas about what was within the realm of possibility and what wasn't. And here I thought to myself, this is definitely something that I can do. And so, thus started my journey into the Org mode libraries, and. I'm, I won't go too much into details right now because right now the main objective that I have is just to show you how simple it is to become a, a maintainer, how to become more involved with the developments. But you know, the libraries in org mode, they're written in ELISP, which is a very, uh, it might seem like an obscure language and it certainly is, but 
as soon as you get the logic of the language, and I'm coming, you know, what I'm telling you is coming from someone who's never studied programming, you know, it made sense. It just, everything is so verbose when you get into the code. When you learn how the rudiments of ELISP, you start getting to the code and you start thinking, wow, okay, that makes sense. And you start developing a logic for all this. And so equipped as I was with this new knowledge, you know, I went on my project, I went into the org gender code and I thought, okay, is there anything that I can use to do my bidding? And fast forward maybe two to three weeks of uh, intense turmoil and uh, many nights which were spent uh, single-mindedly working on this project. Two weeks after I had something that was working and I was pretty happy about it. And you know, that was a key landmark for me because when that happened, it just felt like, okay, I can contribute something to org mode and I can do something that would benefit as many people as possible. And for me, that was the click. That's when it occurred. That's when I went on my first project and I did something that felt useful to the community. And now, nowadays, you know, as I told you, I maintain packages, but really nothing has changed. The only thing maybe that has changed is that I've turned my mind onto other problems. And maybe I've got three more minutes and I like to finish by maybe something a little different. I've told you my story and I hope I've stressed how little effort it took me to move from steps to steps on the ladder. The ladder implies a sense of hierarchy, but there really isn't. But whatever your step on the journey of Emacs is, you know, uh, some of you might be at a step where you're really worried about learning ELISP because it feels like such a monumental task to be undertaking and you have no experience whatsoever. Well, the thing is, maybe you could try climbing this first step on the ladder. Maybe you could try, you know, if you have any project, any, you know, if you've been using org mode, maybe one day you thought, oh, yes, maybe I, I wish I could do this, but I can't. Or maybe do try to do this. Maybe do try to change something in a major mode that you're using and which you feel might be better. It's, I think Emacs, org mode, and all three software in general, as, the, as this tendency to give you this idea that, you know, I can be a hacker. I can hacker in, in the sense of the term that you're modifying things to do your bidding. And for me, I believe this to be a very healthy attitude towards software. You know, um, as Hamin said in the very beginning, uh, we are doing this entire presentation, th sorry, this entire conference with free software. I just see all the things we've been able to do in free software. And for me, Emacs was my gateway, so to speak, into how to contribute to free software about the philosophy that surrounds it. And what I would like to do, and I'll finish on this note, and then I'll be taking your questions, just try. You know, just, you know, you've read on Reddit that you needed to go through the ELIS manual in Emacs. You know, you might be scared, but just do it. Just give it a shot. Just give it maybe one afternoon, try to read it, try to see if this appeals to your mind. and. If you've been interested enough in my presentation right now, and if you're interested enough in any of the talks you're going to have during the entire conference, do give it a shot. And I'm pretty sure you will like the journey on which you will be embarking upon. So I believe I'm finishing one minute early, but uh, I see quite a bit of questions already. So uh, I'm not sure, Sasha, I mean, uh, should I just be reading the questions? Or I mean, do you want to be feeding me the questions? You are it's now. really up to you. Um, it's completely up to you if, you know, if you've got the questions open and can take them or like read them by all means, please. Okay. Well, I'm going to read them because I've got them on the side. So I'm going to start with the one at the bottom. So do you feel that being white and male contributed to your experience? Uh, yeah, I mean, I do believe, uh, there's an idea of privilege. I mean, I'm French. I live in, uh, I'm lucky enough to be uh, at university. Okay, and I'm fairly aware of the discrepancies that happen e even in France, according to this. So yes, I believe my uh, my journey was heavily influenced by this. And 
if you if you would like to specify the question, please do. But I don't have really all that much to ask on this. Uh, so, what is your advice to start learning Elise language? Any particular good resource or any other tips? So, I finished uh, my presentation by telling you about the Elisp introduction, which is built in into Emacs. So, what I might do, I'm going to share my screen just to show you how this works. So, I will be sharing this window. Oh, I believe it's frozen on my hand, so I can't see anything. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see me or if my camera is moving. OK, so my Firefox is frozen. So I'll, I'll answer the question, but I won't be able to show you what I wanted to show you. But uh, there's a built-in guide inside Emacs to learn Elisp. And maybe the best chance that you have is just to go open these info pages. I'm sure someone will be kind enough to mention this to you in uh, the Emacs Conf channel on ISC. But you know, it's probably the best way to get started with Elisp. I mean, you know, we tend to get obsessed with software and with programming about what's the best way to get started. You know, you see so many people who are heavily interested in getting started with programming, but they never manage to get started because there's so much choice. My advice would be to just get started. Don't get so worried about the first step. And, well, if I may still recommend the first step, I, even after saying this, uh, well, do try to start with the built-in guides. I believe they're pretty, pretty good. Uh, so there was another question. It's the last question that I can read. And after that, I mean, you'll, we all have to read the questions for me because everything is frozen on my hands. <laughs> so, oh, OK. I hope it's I'm not frozen in a very bad position. So please excuse me if I'm, uh, <laughs> my mouth is half open or anything. <laughs> no, we just completely but... lost the video feed, so no worries. Oh, splendid. So I won't have to make a fool out of myself. <laughs> so uh, the last question I wanted to, to answer was, have you read Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency? And no, I haven't. I hope it's not a, a, a jab at the way I'm dressing for the conference. But uh, yeah, I haven't read it. So was there any other question? Um, yeah, so there's, um, I see one other question. Um, any recommendation for good packaging guides or places to start? I get a bit overwhelmed by some things, um, for example, the choice of different test frameworks. Right, OK, so that's a very good question. And I believe uh, Alpha Papa is in the chat right now. But uh, as myself, a Nealisp developer for Ogrom, I'd really recommend you to look into his package developer's guide, because you have a list of all the softwares that are extremely useful to be using when you're getting started. but. Maybe if you're looking into a first step, you know, for how to develop ELS package, I'd really advise you to look into eDebug. So it's uh, in one word, e and debug. And you have a section in the manual for this. Because for me, it was the key step to getting to uh, develop good packages. Uh, it was understanding basically what the code did. And having a, uh, something like uh, REPL that allows you to step through the code and see exactly which states the variables are at which at this point in the, in the program. That's really my biggest advice to you. Cool. Any other question? Thanks. Yeah, um, I see one or two more. Um, so there's one they ask, how did the freedom of Emacs help you on your way? So the freedom of Emacs. Uh, so I, I mentioned that Emacs for me was my gateway into free software. And the freedom of Emacs was that you could, maybe the first and foremost compared to uh, other software, was that you had behind Emacs Elisp, which allows you to read the code, read whatever is going on in the background. So surely if you go deep enough, you'll end up on C uh, functions that you might not be able to read if you do not have the experience. But for org mode, which was my gateway into Emacs, most of it is written in Elisp. And all the commands, which have a very verbose name, like something simple as org go to next subtree or org go to uh, parent subtree, you know, things like this. It's so elegant. It's so verbose. And, you know, that's a sense of freedom insofar as you can go into the code and see, oh, OK, that's how it's implemented. So I believe in a way that the freedom and the liberty that is given to you to look into the code is something that invites you to do the same with your life. And you know, as someone who does a little bit of philosophy on the side, I believe it's a very healthy message to be garnering from a piece of software. Awesome. Thank you. Um, let's see. So we have. 
think I saw another question pop up. I'm not too sure how we're doing as far as time is concerned, but I believe we have like one or two minutes more. Um, yeah, actually, so we're quite a bit ahead of the schedule. So if we take a little bit longer, we're fine. Sure. Okay. So if you have, if you do have more questions, so please do. I'm just yep. sorry that my video is not working anymore. No problem. Um, yeah, so <laughs> someone was actually saying, what's the most recent... Oh, sorry. I, uh, well, actually, yeah. Oh, well, before that. Please show off your three-piece suit before you end your talk, which requires fixing your frozen camera. If this is not possible, please post suit selfies on easily accessible location. <laughs> okay, I'll make sure to do this. But uh, yes, I, I wanted to uh, hype things up for the conference. So yes, I did get the three-piece suit out. And I'm very glad you like it. And by the way, when you get a chance to see me live again, do appreciate that my tie has both the colors of Emacs, purple, and also of old mode green. So it took me a while to find this one. So I hope you will you, you will appreciate this. <laughs> awesome. Um, let's see, we have one qu other question. Um, what's the most recent Emacs package or tool that you've discovered that you've added uh, to your repertoire? Um, very interesting question. Um, you know, the thing is, when you spend so long, well, you've spent as long as I have on Emacs, and I know that I've only spent eight years, and some of you might have spent maybe 10, 20, maybe even more years on Emacs. But for me, I believe the the coolest neat trick that I found on Emacs was a mode which is called Beacon Mode, so B-E-A-C-O-N-M-O-D-E. And it's something that allows you to show uh, when you're jumping between buffers or when you're jumping between windows, it shows exactly where your point is in that buffer by making a slight ray of light, which looks like a beacon, hence the name. And it really helps you navigate buffers because it always shows in a very visual way where your point is. And you'll, I'll get a chance to show this to you later today when I'll be presenting my other talks. Uh. Awesome. Oh, um, we have one question from Tarsius or Jonas, the uh, maintainer from Magit or Magit. He asks, when you touch your webcam, that blew a fuse at my place. How did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm very sorry, Jonas, that it happened to you, but uh, I'll make sure not to touch my webcam again. <laughs> <laughs> OK, um, do we have any other questions? Well, I, I, I have to trust you on this one, so I'm really right. sorry. Everything is frozen on my end. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, I'm more talking to the audience, I guess. Yeah, well, uh, I hope my uh, lack of uh, slides didn't bother you, but I really wanted to have this uh, verbose time with the people to be able to... Uh, it's a message that I've been uh, trying to share with as many people as possible, and... Uh, uh, in France, we do have uh, an Emacs uh, workshop, actually, that we have on a monthly basis. And, you know, I've been learning a lot with those people, and I felt like um, doing the same with the Emacs conference would be good. And that's why I'm really happy, and I'm really lucky to have had the chance to, uh, to do this today. And I hope some of you, I've convinced you of climbing another step on the ladder or making another step in a journey. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Leo. Um... You know, I happen to completely agree, agree with your not necessarily using a slide when it's, you know, not really needed and to help give some face to face time, um, you know, with the audience. Unfortunately, your webcam cut out, but I mean, before that. <laughs> um, yes, I'll make sure yeah. to fix the problems later on. So don't worry about it. <laughs> awesome. Um, All righty. I guess we're wrapping up um, for your talk and get ready for the next talk. Sure. Well, thank you so much. And I'll see you all guys later, I suppose. Sounds good. Thank you again, Leo. Sure. Bye-bye.